combination of an update on TCI as well as a little bit of a teaser on what's coming up next week. Um, as many of you know, TCI has been um, going on for a long time, but it really accelerated this year with the, uh, the commitment from 12 states plus the District of Columbia to sit down and work together to develop a framework for a, a regional program to um, lower the greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. Just in terms of the magnitude of this, this region really looks at about 278 million tons of CO2 per year that are uh, emitted from this sector. So there's a lot, there's a big impact here. It's a, been a pretty amazing effort and with bipartisan leadership of all the, the governments that have been involved. And we've been working all year on this. We've had many, many meetings um, at all different staff levels with different focuses. There's been three large regional public workshops and we've engaged over 500 stakeholders and got probably a thousand comments online on, on the framework that we are working on. Um, what's coming out in on December 17th, which is next Tuesday, is another major status uh, update from uh, Georgetown Climate Initiative, or Climate Center, and it's gonna have three parts. The first part's gonna be a draft MOU for all 12 governors plus the, uh, the mayor of the District of Columbia. And it's gonna, the, the core of that is really to, uh, to memorialize a commitment to seek to establish this regional cap and invest program with a declining cap over, uh, over a 10 year period. Attached to that MOU is gonna be an appendix that's got a lot of the, uh, the nuts and bolts of the program. And I can't really go into this, it's all kind of embargo until next uh, Tuesday, but I can tell you that, that it'll deal with the, the approach to regulated entities, like who's gonna have to comply with this program, who's gonna have to buy the, uh, the emissions allowances, and that's gonna be uh, a combination of, of entities called position holders, as well as enterers. And these are, these are people in the, uh, the petroleum industry that deliver the products. The regulated materials will be uh, gasoline and on-road diesel. We've been talking about that all along. Um, and then the program period that's going to be modeled is from 2022 to 2032, the 10 year period. There's a reference case that looks at, all right, what happens to emissions in the transportation sector over that 10 year period if we don't do anything? And there was a lot of work going into this. And one of the things we realized is there's huge amounts of uncertainty and the uncertainty is based on two things. Number one, we don't know what's going on with respect to federal policy right now, especially on the environment and transportation sector. And then the third thing, uh, the second thing is there's a lot of volatility in fuel prices as it is. So how does that factor in? So this, there's going to be this reference case with a certain uncertainty factor into it. And then there's gonna be three cases modeled off that. And these are gonna be three caps with um, with reduction scenarios over those 10 years. And we really want to get comments on this, which, what, um, what people think about it. And in each one of those scenarios, they're going to be talking about the impacts on greenhouse gas emissions, obviously, but also public health impacts and economic impacts. So that obviously this is a big balancing act, but that's what the models really show, that, um, that there is a balance between the environmental benefits and the climate benefits and the, and the costs that will be uh, born on the economy. All of these are modeled in the context of, of sort of an investment scenario, and it's a very generic investment scenario that includes things like electric vehicle investments, infrastructure for EVs, um, more electric and clean transportation, buses and trucks, um, better transit options, and, and expanded pedestrian and bike um, options as well. Now every state is going to have the ability and absolutely maintains the ability to come up with their own investment mix. And we need to come up with the optimal investment mix for us. But they did, needed to model something. And what they found though is it's absolutely <coughs> critical to take whatever proceeds come from the auction of those allowances and reinvest them in transportation. Uh, clean transportation in order for the system to work. So that's that's kind of a teaser for what's coming up um, next week. There'll be a public comment period that'll go uh, 60 days into 2020, and then our intention is to to really try and finalize this MOU 
and get everybody to sign off by late spring. The, uh, the to-do list for 2020 is going to be to develop a model rule, which is going to have to in incorporate all these program elements that we've organized this year, and, um, and also to start talking about how to set up the regional organization that'll, that'll run the auctions and, and manage the proceeds and sort of manage the whole system. Those are the two big things. And then the idea is coming out of that, once we get the model rule, at that point, the different jurisdictions will go back and get their own enabling legislation or regulation or whatever they need to, uh, to give them the authority to participate. So that's where we're at. It's a big, uh, big announcement next week. And that's going to be, I think it's going to be a big deal. And, uh, it's a huge amount of work, and it looks really good, a really solid program. Um, thanks, Terry. I'll just emphasize that this bipartisan group of state um, commissioners and, and um, have all been working really hard because this is the biggest set for greenhouse gas emissions. We don't have um, a great way of approaching it just at our own Rhode Island scale. So um, it's all been a lot of hard work, but kind of the more, the most work is still to come. And it's going to need a lot of engagement, um, a lot of public input, and a lot of uh, building of support and excitement around these possibilities to invest uh, tens of millions of dollars into mobility, uh, and transportation. So it could really help us when we put together the greenhouse gas production plan. A lot of it was we need to penetrate EVs more, we need to have more options. And so I think this could be the mechanism to help us really move fast around that. Uh, do people at the council have questions for Terry? Terry, uh, so this morning there was an opinion piece in the newspaper on, really? on this uh, <laughs> initiative. And uh, so I'm wondering, since uh, this is going to require uh, legislative approval in each jurisdiction, um, what uh, is, is there going to be uh, some thought in terms of how to address the General Assembly, knowing that there's going to be a fair amount of um, adversarial uh, uh, decisions no, no on this? No thought will go with that. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that piece is there a, a lot of misinformation. I, I, I am sure. But I made but the point two things. One thing you said is not accurate. Not every state does need to go to the General Assembly. Some states have already authorized the legislation. And of course, that would be a major element of what you've been doing. So I will tell you that, that it's an old adage of don't believe everything you read in the paper. <laughs> and um, well, I think that definitely fits here. Yes, yeah. no, there's a lot, of, a lot of inaccuracy. So of course. That way. Um, wait till next week, you'll see a little bit more of the, of the specifics of what's talk, talked about. Um, there has been a lot of work into analyzing the public health and economic benefits of this program. And those those are going to be uh, big selling points to turn into uh, to support the program. And the other thing is this issue of the investment plan. There's going to be an investment plan put together that's going to that's going to be the best use of this money for Rhode Island. And that's going to be a key selling point in terms of getting public acceptance and political acceptance of the program. So, yeah. Yeah, my my point being that obviously strategy with people that are thinking about it really needs to be rock solid um, because there is going to be opposition to this. Oh, sure. So we want to make sure we've got a solid strategy in place to make sure it's successful. Yep. And it's got to be, uh, let's start with the facts, right? And that's Absolutely. that's where we're starting right now. We did a lot of work in terms of modeling and setting this up. So. Um, I'm just follow up with it. Terry, thank you for, for all the leadership you and Janet have uh, put forward on behalf of Rhode Island because I think that staying close to the details is really going to be critical to um, being credible and executing on this as well as we possibly can for Rhode Island. Uh, so, uh, but I think the other thing is for all the people who are attending here to uh, be part of thinking through this. What are the pros? What are the cons? What are the things that get people excited about this because it's, um, the modeling is not going to win hearts and minds. The modeling is solid, the modeling is excellent, and the work that's been put in is fabulous, but now if we're going to win hearts and minds, it's not just people to stay out. We have to 
kind of win over people generally to the importance of this and help people get excited. So I would urge all of us, both on the council and um, other people <coughs> from the broader stakeholder world, to really start thinking about what is it that is important and urgent and exciting about TCI over the coming months. I think that is the work ahead in 2020. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, Scott, would you like to